Good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Scholl. I am the lead learner at the SCEA Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. We call ourselves Cool. You can see the logo in the upper right uh, on the right hand corner. Um, I hope you're having a great night. And I am uh, always thrilled with every live stream we do. This is the first one that we've done since we started this series on nutrition. And when we talk about uh, wellness, um, one of the most important things is is what we're putting into our bodies, how, the nutrition that we're giving ourselves. So um, I was thrilled to death when our guest tonight agreed to come on and she described what she was going to talk about. And I thought this is su such a perfect message for educators, for administrators, um, for our bus drivers, our cafeteria staff, but for all people who are working in public education, such an important thing for us to take care of our physical health. So our guest tonight is Stephanie Mahachek. Uh, she's a board certified clinical nutritionist with over 12 years in the nutrition and wellness industry. She focuses on getting to the root cause of each problem and health concern based on clinical science and behavior change. Stephanie believes that nutrition needs to be individual and restrictive dieting is rarely the answer. She helps clients of all ages determine the best way of eating for their body and their lifestyle through targeting nutrition, coaching, and habit change. Stephanie's the mother of four and is a softie for animals of all kinds. She has a dog, a tortoise, a bearded dragon, and two bunnies, which turned into two four bunnies unknowingly. <laughs> so I'm going to bring on Stephanie. Stephanie, how are you doing tonight? I am so good, Todd. I'm so glad to be here. I'm super excited to talk about this, and I cannot wait to, to hear and, and interact with the teachers and the admins. I am so pumped to talk about this. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I... Um, this is something that I've struggled with on and off throughout my adult life. You know, um, when I was younger, I could eat pretty much anything and it didn't seem to have a major impact on my weight or my health or my overall feeling of well-being. Um, and as I got older, I noticed I really had to pay closer attention to what I was consuming, uh, particularly with a history of heart disease in my family. And, um, and so this is just, but it's something that like, it feels like sometimes I get in a rhythm with it and then sometimes um, I get out of the rhythm with it. So I'm really interested in hearing what you have to share tonight and I'm just going to turn things right over to you. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, yeah, that actually your story, it, it, it ties in perfectly with exactly what we're going to talk about. And I can explain why that's going on for you and, and, and most people actually, when they reach a certain age, they realize, oh, I'll, my metabolism's slowing down. I'm just getting older. I'm doing all the, you know, this, that, and the other thing and however we want to fill that in. Um, but there is a clinical reason for it and there's a behavioral reason for it. And we, we're actually going to dive into both of those things today. So um, I am totally open to questions as we go. I don't, I, I think when I get going here, I won't be able to necessarily see them. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get your question answered. If you do have a question, feel free to just type it in. So um, as Todd said, I am a board certified clinical nutritionist, and I do have a huge passion for educating people on all things nutrition, but not just how many carbs to get, how many grams of this, that, and the other thing. Is fat good? Is fat bad? Should I have caffeine? All of this. Yes, that is important, but even more so are the habits that are tied to that and our understanding of what different phases of life bring for us. So a big part of, of how I educate people um, of all ages and stages is what is right for you. Let's teach you how to relearn your body's cues and what it, it's telling you it needs. And that can change as we get older and as we go through different phases of life. So the conversation today is going to be more around stress eating. And um, stress eating is actually one of those things that it gets lumped in to emotional eating a lot you know, stress and emotional eating are often interchangeable. And, and that's not exactly accurate. Um, emotional eating encompasses all emotion. Stress is just one part of the emotional eating. So when you're saying I'm a stress eater, which a lot of people will label, label themselves as a stress eater, um, that could mean something different to each person. And so you really have to dive in and talk a little bit more about what, what are the symptoms of that? What are you doing with that? Is it more anxiety related? Is it more a stress response, which we'll talk more about? Um, is it actually you're eating when you're happy? You're eating when you're sad. You're eating when you're scared. You're eating when you're angry. You know, those are all emotions. So you might be more of an emotional eater, which is a different um, kind of way about uh, coming at it. So for this topic today, I want to I want to have everyone kind of and I know we'll have people kind of filtering in so I want to have everyone kind of connect with how you're feeling. It's easy to be in a rush. You've probably had a busy day. It's a Tuesday right after a holiday weekend. Maybe if you're a teacher, you're you're 
class was chaos, class was chaos. All, all of the things. Um, but I want you to just take a, take a breath, take a breath, connect with how you're feeling. And, and it couldn't, maybe it's not just today. Maybe it is in general, like lately you've been noticing you're drained or you're stressed out or you're bloated feeling. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you feel puffy or inflamed. Um, maybe you feel like you're lacking. I get that a lot. I, these are actually words people describe them when I'm talking with them in my private practice. Um, they'll say that they feel like something is missing from their health and they don't know what it is. A lot of times it's nutrients. A lot of times it's specific uh, foods or food categories. Uh, and that comes from years and decades of dieting. We are, we are training ourselves to restrict and that's not what our bodies needs. Our bodies are not designed to restrict food. Um, maybe you're having some headaches or migraines that are, are more frequent. Um, maybe you're feeling tired. I mean, tired is one of the things that we all just blame tired on. Oh, I didn't get enough sleep or, oh, my kids woke me up or, oh, um, I have to go to the bathroom. It's just one of those things that happen as we get older in the middle of the night. Uh, and being tired does, does not have to be normal for you. It doesn't have to be normal. There's plenty of people who go about their day who don't need a nap at 2 p.m., who don't need to, you know, recover on the weekends. Um, that is a symptom. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And digestive issues is another thing that I see a lot. And people don't connect that with stress. And they don't connect that all the time with maybe something that is missing or a habit that they're doing that is no longer serving them. So all of these can actually be tied in more with stress and stress eating and response to emotional eating and, and, um, and, and the overall stress response. So connect with those and really just see what are, what are the symptoms that you're feeling? And I'm going to go over a few more in a minute here. Um, but, but what's one that kind of sticks out for you and we can kind of pull those apart. Um, as, as Todd said, I, I won't go over this whole thing. This is, uh, you know, just kind of a little bit of background on me and where I'm coming at. Like he said, I do have a lot of a clinical mindset when it comes to this, it, as far as all my education and my training go. And I am a current doctoral student. So for those of you who are teachers, I'm a student and I'm always a student. I will forever be a student, especially when it comes to nutrition, because it's ever changing and new things are being discovered left and right all the time. It's a, it's an awesome field to be in and I just can't get enough. So, um, and I do have a, a whole lot of certifications that I incorporate in with my coaching and in with my teachings and my trainings, because the more I pick up, the better I can help somebody else. And, and so many things, when you come at things from a holistic standpoint, you need different experiences within that to help overall get to the root of somebody's uh, concern. So a little bit about what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about some of the hidden symptoms of stress. Um, a lot of it can be physical and a lot of it may not be what you think they are. Uh, we're also going to talk about nutrition's role in the stress response. So I get a lot like, what can I eat to, to help calm me down? And that's not, that's not exactly the avenue that we're going to go down. We're going to talk about other things in response to that. But uh, nutrition does play a huge role in how your body responds and prepares for stressors. And then we're going to talk about some small action uh, steps to take that's going to help you support your body. I actually did because I do have a clinical kind of mindset. I did some research in, before when I found out I was going to be, you know, talking with everybody here. I did some research with some uh, with some teacher friends of mine of various age groups, everything from pre-K all the way up to the college level to see what kind of issues that they're noticing with their own nutrition and, and within the, the schools and, and everything. So I got some insider insight, if you will, on uh, some things that hopefully will resonate with you that we can then put together some small action steps for you to take away tonight and put into play for you for tomorrow. So... Um, overall, when I think of optimal health, this is kind of what I picture. Um, there's a lot of moving parts and, you know, you'll notice that stress is on the outside of one side. Movement is also on, on the outside and sleep is kind of that foundational underlying thing in the pyramid. Um, now you'll also notice that there are three layers within this triangle. And this is what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, but coming at things from a holistic uh, mindset or a holistic standpoint, all of these things are connected in some way. Movement helps with stress. Sleep helps with stress. Movement helps with sleep. Sleep can help you manage stress. And all of these things are intertwined. And when one of them is off, the pyramid falls apart. The pyramid collapses. So when we go through each of these layers on the inside, um, I, I hope that it's going to kind of, it, it's a different way of thinking about stress and stress response and symptoms um, that hopefully it will make sense when we kind of go along here. 
So the very tippity top of this pyramid are symptoms. This is what we focus on. When something is quote unquote wrong, we focus on the symptoms. We notice this stuff. This is the things that we notice. And we tend to focus on uh, the, uh, the, the symptoms related to stress in particular. So like I said, the bloating, you might notice some headaches, you might notice some weight gain. Um, and stress has the ability for many of us to be stored as a physical symptom. We call this a psychosomatic response. It's a mental stressor that turns into a physical symptom within the body. This is where fibromyalgia gets its name. This is, um, you know, frequent migraines. And, and some people like to just say, oh, I just always get migraines. Could that be, though, that maybe you're having a response to stressors that you're not addressing? So there's a lot of things that can be internalized and manifest as physical symptoms within our body. IBS or digestive issues is another one. Um, often those have a stress component to them, which tend to get blown off by some professionals, but it can really be a, a pivotal point that needs to be addressed if the problem is going to resolve. Um, so when it comes to stress eating, we often picture kind of that, that stereotypical emotional woman with a pint of ice cream on the couch and she's crying. And, you know, this is the media and TV kind of poking fun at a really serious issue. In fact, most of the time, stress eating is silent. Stress response to that is silent. It's hidden kind of out of shame or even maybe the opposite. Maybe it's viewed as kind of just a common coping technique among groups of friends or family, and it's kind of just laughed off. But it's a really serious issue that, as you can see, can manifest into some physical symptoms. And when physical symptoms go unaddressed, they get worse. And they might turn into an actual condition. You know, there's a big difference between having just a symptom of bloating versus having a diagnosed condition of IBS, you know, but they can, if they don't get resolved, they can be, they can get worse and manifest worse into, into longer term things. So they definitely, it's an important thing to get addressed. So rooted in symptoms, <laughs> every symptom that you can possibly think of has a nutrition component to it, which I think is so cool. <laughs> I'm a little biased, obviously, being a nutritionist, but but nutrition is the, it's, I, I almost said it's the root of every symptom, but it's not, and I'll explain why in a second. But every symptom is based off of nutrition. So these are some of the components that you'd want to look at. So you want to look at fiber. So if fiber is so important to get in our diets. And fiber is one of those things that most Americans are not getting enough of. In fact, I just did a podcast episode on this. It's coming out tomorrow, all about fiber and digestive wellness. And what's, what's ironic is that we need to get about 25 to 35, maybe up to 40 grams of fiber in a day. That's for the average American adult what the average American adult actually gets is about nine. So we're all coming in pretty shy, not even half of what is recommended. And the reason why fiber is so important, especially when it comes to stress and stress management and coping with stress is because it gets our digestive system flowing. When the digestive system flows, when there's proper uh, balance of the good and the bad bacteria, this helps to generate certain neurotransmitters like serotonin, like dopamine, like GABA, all of these things that are very much tied to how we cope with stress and how we build stress in our bodies. So fiber is so key and so important. And one of the things that is, is lacking in a lot of diets, um, food timing is another thing. And I'm going to come back to at the end, we'll go over some ways to get some of these nutrients in. Um, but food timing is another thing that most people, especially busy teachers, do not do. <laughs> they aren't because they can't, you know, and I am so sympathetic to, um, to the teachers and their schedules. Uh, but food timing is one of those things that has a huge role in how you respond to stress and in how your body is set up to, you know, manage symptoms. So when I say food timing, I'm talking more about, um, are you eating, are you going long periods of time without eating something? What this does, and, and we can talk about intermittent fasting, and everyone, somebody is always going to ask that question about intermittent fasting, so we can answer that at the end if you want. But food timing, what that does is if you go long periods of time without eating, not only are you famished and really hungry the next time you do have something to eat, and you're more likely to over 
overeat to the point where your body maybe hurts or can't process all the nutrients that you just took in. Um, but you're also creating this, this dialogue of insulin and glucose spikes and crashes and spikes and crashes. And when that happens, your energy spikes and crashes, your mood might crash. You, you feel tired after you eat. Like all of these things are so important to stabilize and steady state it. Um, and again, I don't want this to be like, oh, she's telling me I need to do all these things and I can't, you know, there are some creative ways that you can get some nutrients throughout the day. Um, and we can definitely, you know, uh, brainstorm some at the end, but, um, but even on days where maybe you're not at work or even on days, if, if you're one of those people who say that, um, I'm not a breakfast eater, uh, that might be, but could you get some sort of liquid nutrition in your body if that's going to be the only time you're going to eat until noon, you know? So, um, food timing is huge when it comes to nutrition and it comes to managing some of those symptoms. Um, sugar of course is another thing that is so prevalent in our diets. And I am again, not one to say absolutely no sugar for anybody ever. That's miserable. Nobody wants that. And it's pretty hard. Um, but sugar is one of those things that because it's creeping into everything, ketchup, dressings, drinks, everything. Sugar is creeping into a lot of things. And if those are the foods that are the quick grab and go foods and the only food items that you're going to be able to, to intake that day, and a lot of it's rooted in sugar, that causes a problem. That causes some symptoms. That causes the most notorious thing, inflammation. And it's, sugar is highly, highly inflammatory in our bodies. And when there's inflammation, there's an immune response. And when there's an immune response, other symptoms and things can manifest. So sugar is one of those things. Um, again, don't need to be sugar-free. Uh, if you are, great. If, if that scares you, <laughs> I'm with you. I can't be sugar-free either. Um, but it's one of those things to maybe check. Check yourself you know, before anything turns into a big problem or a symptom. Or it could be something that you could tie a symptom to. So if you have headaches, are you having a lot of artificial sweeteners? Are you having a lot of sugar in your diet? That could be the cause of some of those symptoms that you're having. Hydration is another one and a big one I know with, with educators. Uh, they can't always hit bathroom breaks. So what do you do? You know, and, and I, have a, I have a plan for you. Don't worry. Um, but hydration is another thing that can easily turn. When you're dehydrated, it can easily turn into symptoms um, that can that can be a stressor on your body and cause you to not cope well with stressors as they come. Um, so things like headaches and energy crashes and dry skin and uh, moodiness, all feeling tired, all of those things are signs of dehydration that sometimes you don't connect the dots with. Uh, but hydration is definitely something to uh, pay attention to before it turns into other symptoms. Um, of course, fruits and veggies is one thing that as a nutritionist, I think it's like etched in our <laughs> DNA that we have to talk about fruits and veggies. Um, but vegetables are another thing that we are not simply getting enough of in our society. So vegetables, when it comes to stress and a stress response, vegetables and, and fruits and veggies not only provide the fiber that we were talking about, but they provide hydration. Uh, they provide things like magnesium, which is a calming nutrient. You probably have heard things or seen magnesium uh, advertise as a aid for sleep or as a calming uh, nutrient or supplement. You can get them from fruits and veggies and, and making sure that we're getting enough of the, the fruits and veggies in our diet. And I, I know hopefully you're asking the question, well, how much should I be getting? Um, I don't want to tell you because people tend to freak out, but it's, it's, it used to be five to seven and now it's about seven to nine. Um, but if you're at the point where you're like, I can get one, maybe a day, maybe every other day, start there and work your way up. It's okay. And, and we can talk more about how to get more veggies in. Um, and then food quality is probably one of the biggest concerns right now in the U S is the, the quality of our food. Our food is not food. It's not, it's, it's edible to the point where you're not going to die when you eat it <laughs> immediately. But Long term, these chemicals in our foods, these preservatives, these dyes, these food colorings, these um, all of these things in our food is having a long term effect on our bodies. And when you think of food quality, you don't have to, again, eat whole foods all the time, only whole foods, nothing processed ever, ever, ever. It's more like, what are you getting the majority of the time? At the majority of the time, if you're able to get decent quality foods that are whole foods, very minimal ingredients, um, 
I'm not sure I'll, uh, I've seen a lot of the cafeterias in my area have really stepped it up when it comes to food quality. And it's pretty, it's pretty great to see. Um, but the majority of the time is what matters. And so when you're intaking, if you're intaking foods that are highly processed, highly processed meats, really uh, preserved foods have a lot of like nasty chemically named things on your ingredient list. If you're intaking those the majority of the time, your body will cause, it will do an infl inflammatory response because it doesn't recognize that as food. It's not, it's not food, it's a chemical. So it will send an inflammation response and an immune response and cause inflammation, which causes symptoms, which causes all the things to happen. So food quality is definitely a very, very important thing that uh, we can't go without talking about because that's, that's so prevalent right now. So, oh, I, I gave it away, shoot. All right, so what do you think is rooted what is nutrition rooted in? So symptoms are rooted from nutrition. What is nutrition rooted in? And I already gave it away, dang it, but that's okay. It's your mindset. It's your beliefs. It's your history and it's your habits. So all of those things impact what you choose to eat, which impacts the symptoms that you could have. So I told you it was a little bit different than you probably th saw things going, but but stay with me here for a second. So Todd, when he mentioned about he used to be able to eat whatever he wanted, those are habits. Those are habits that you picked up along the way as a as a child. Um, beliefs tend to be things like, oh, fat's bad for you. I can't have fat. I can't have carbs. I can't have this. I can't have that. Um, they might even be the habits that we have um, from growing up. If anyone's a part of the Clean Your Plate Club. That is a habit that was learned to you. It was passed down from parents to, you know, grandparents to parents to us. And these are all habits now that are the indicator of how we choose the foods that we choose. Every action that we take, every habit we form, everything we do currently is rooted in our core mindset and beliefs. So in this case with food, you know, you can really say this is kind of true for anything, relationships, finances, anything. But in this case, we're talking about food. And when we break down stress eating, this is a response we have. We've learned it as a response to stress. So maybe it's how your parents or maybe your caregivers uh, responded to stress by eating something or, or binging on something. A lot of times we see this with, um, uh, cultural things. If you celebrate birthdays, and of course you have birthday cake on your birthday, or you have pizza Friday night, pizza night, which is what we do in our house. Um, but you know, some of those things are passed down and they're all just learned behaviors tied to a specific thing. Um, so maybe, you know, you made it all the way through to college and you you saw your roommate binge on pizza during finals because they were so stressed out, whatever it is, it's a learned response and it's something that can be unlearned. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, contributors to stress eating. So I want to do just a super brief, um, and I totally lost the, the video. So if you guys are, are talking, sorry about that. I can't see your comments. Um, but so I, I want to talk about the stress response, kind of like the stress response 101. What is the stress response even? We tend to just think, oh, it's just, I feel, I feel stressed out during something. It's a survival technique. It's a survival mechanism. It's something that we have, have developed over eons of humans being humans. It's a survival thing. Back in the day, it was, we need to make sure that a bear isn't gonna attack us as we leave our cave. So it's called that fight or flight response. This in the physiology standpoint, it's cortisol and adrenaline. Those are two of the fight or flight response hormones, neurotransmitters, all those things. Um, and, and it's a stressor. It's meant to be a quick burst to save your life. So either if there's something that is that your, your vision picks up on as a stressor, you are either going to fight the thing or you're going to flee. But both of those things need these, these two hormones, cortisol and, and adrenaline to get the blood and the nutrients to the specific body parts that need to either run like your muscles and your, your heart. Um, or, or fight, you know, so you need those particular things. What happens though, is because nutrients are diverted to those certain um, body parts, organs, and, and so forth, they're rerouted from other areas that don't need to be involved or that aren't involved in fight or fleeing. So these would be things like reproductive organs. These would be things like your digestive system. So a lot of times when people have depression or they have um, anxiety or they have other kind of um, 
these really intense, stressful mindset type of things, their digestive system is not working properly. And that is because the nutrients are not flowing properly to them. And, and that's just a response of having cortisol and adrenaline in excess in your body. Now, in the short term, cortisol and adrenaline are a good thing. When we are chronically stressed out, though, it's not so much. It's, it's actually inflammatory. So back in the day, yeah, we, we're not fighting bears anymore, most of us. We're not running from things from our cave you know, we are now dealing with traffic. We're dealing with kids. We're dealing with parents. We're dealing with job stresses. We're dealing with family stresses. We're dealing with all of these things. The physiology, the physiological response is the same. The stressor is different. And when the physiological response is the same for something that's meant to be short term, you can see how that can be a problem. It can cause that chronic inflammation to happen, uh, which can then lead to things like the offsetting of different hormones, sleep issues, digestive issues, reproductive issues, a lot of different things because of these cortisol and adrenaline hormones are in excess when they're not supposed to be. Also, when your uh, nutrient supplies are being routed to certain things, this, uh, the cortisol and adrenaline are very much tied into how you manage and process glucose and insulin. And so when that glucose and insulin uh, dynamic is off, that's when you get crashes during the day. You get the hangries. You can you get all of these negative things. Insulin resistance can occur. All of these stuff can happen simply because you're chronically stressed out. Um, so adding to a, uh, another contributor of stress and stress eating is inflammatory foods. What are those things that we reach for when we're the typical stressed out person? It's foods that are probably not anti-inflammatory. They're more inflammatory. They're the sugary things. They're the carbohydrate things. Um, they're the processed foods. They're the quick grab and go stuff, the ice creams, all of that. And that's adding, it's like adding fuel to the fire because you're already in a state of inflammation from your own hormones. <laughs> now you're adding food to that and that's causing an even deeper inflammatory response. Um, and that, of course, leads to other symptoms, things like malabsorption. When your digestive system is not working properly, you're not absorbing your food and you're not absorbing the nutrients well. And that can lead to deficiencies and nutrition or nutritional deficiencies. And that can lead to hormone imbalances and all sorts of other symptoms, all because of chronic stress. So you might be thinking, well, what in the world? What do we do? So we need to start from the, back, the, the ground up, right? If our mindset and our habits drive our food choices which lead to relief of symptoms, then it makes sense to start with the mindset and, and have that shift. So it doesn't matter which of these elements you start with until you get them addressed and create that solid foundation of beliefs and habits, it's hard to build nutritional habits at last. And I'm convinced that this is why diets don't work. Diets are always around here. It's around what do you eliminate from your nutrition? It's not addressing down here. I don't know if you can even see my pointer, but it's not addressing the baseline of the pyramid. It's only addressing the middle, which sometimes impacts the tip of the, the pyramid, the symptoms. But most of the time, you're just hovering in that nutrition part of things and not addressing the core habits. So even if you were able to restrict down to 1200 calories a day, which please don't, nobody needs that. It doesn't last because you have those beliefs and those habits that pop up. So the second you have, you're faced with a stressor or the second you're faced with maybe something fun and positive, like a vacation, you fall back to those baseline habits because that's comfort, that's comfortable for you. That's where your, that's where your core beliefs are. So I'm, I'm hoping that that made a little bit more sense. Um, okay. So let's look here. So once you have that good solid foundation of the food mindset and the beliefs and the history and the habits, which as I mentioned, are completely changeable. It doesn't matter if you grew up cleaning your plate, you can change that. And I have seen it happen. I had somebody be so uncomfortable leaving food on their plate <laughs> that they had to call me and I had to talk them through it and it's okay. But that was just such a strong core belief and part of who they thought they were that it was, it took a minute to kind of work through that and that's okay. But they got through that and now they have a great pattern of nutrition and they, they are able to listen to their body and stop when they're full. And even if they are faced with a stressor during the day, they don't resort to food as the, the coping strategy with that. They listen to their body and they've implemented other things. So once that, uh, some of those beliefs and that, that habit, and you work through some of the history and historical things, 
then you can start to really target the nutritional part of things. Then you can focus on getting the fiber. Then you can focus on the food timing and the patterns and, and the meal prep and all of that stuff because you have such a solid base and you're ready to take on new habits that they're more likely to stick. And when the nutrition part of things are locked in, then you get a decrease in some of those symptoms. This can kind of go both ways, which is why the arrows are going both ways. But symptoms don't always have to be bad, right? If the outcome, if maybe that's another way of putting it, instead of symptoms, it's an outcome that you're looking for. If the outcome you want is more energy or better health or improved digestion or less headaches or a better response to stress, then you can just follow it down the chain. So what nutritional changes need to happen? What beliefs or mindsets or habits need to occur in order for you to get that outcome that you want? So let's let's put this into an example real quick. Um, let's say that you have um, headaches all the time. You wake up in the morning with a headache all the time and, and it's really starting to bug you. It's, it's debilitating. It's, it's not fun. Well, it comes to find out maybe one of the, the habits that you have is or nutrition or the nutritional habit that you have that kind of supports that symptom is you eat late at night. Maybe you eat ice cream or, or chips or snacks or whatever late at night and you don't get enough sleep. So you can see how addressing that specific habit, which of course that's a habit, you learn that along the way, um, addressing that habit, getting to bed on time, um, not having a snack late at night, that plays into that nutritional part of things. Now your blood sugar is balanced. You're not waking up in the middle of the night because of crashes and the spike in the roller coaster because you didn't have something you know, a minute before you fell asleep. Um, and then that symptom can hopefully dissipate and disappear. So. Sometimes it makes sense to start with the symptom that you have or the outcome that you want and go down the, the pyramid. And sometimes it makes, if you already know a habit that you have that you'd like to uh, switch up, then you can start from the bottom and work your way up. But that's uh, kind of what I had uh, visualized when I kind of talked to people about this. So I asked about 10 or 11 teacher friends um, what they would want to know about stress eating or what their concerns are and, and when it comes to their nutrition. And here's is what some of the things that they said. One of them just flat out said, what do I do? <laughs> and, and that really depends on your symptoms, of course. You know, that could mean a million things. So are you having energy crashes? Are you feeling bloated? Are you doing any of those symptoms or having any of those symptoms that we mentioned? Digestive issues, headaches, anything. The symptom is going to give you a big clue into the nutritional aspect of things and it kind of gives you an avenue to go down. And then usually you can tie a habit to that where that habit that you want to implement or change up um, that will help support that nutritional habit. Um, another person said, we don't get bathroom breaks. So how can I hydrate? And this one, you got to get a little crafty, but you can eat your water. <laughs> and so what I mean by that is, is yes, maybe you're unable to chug a, you know, a 20 ounce bottle of water at every moment that you want, because then you'd have to find someone to cover your classes and you don't have breaks and all that eating your water. So eating hydrating fruits and vegetables throughout the day is not a replacement for getting enough, uh, you know, adequate bottles of water. Um, but that could be the difference between ending your day in a super dehydrated state, um, or, or being mostly hydrated. So, um, a, a good, I actually walked somebody through this, a good kind of routine to think about would be you wake up first thing in the morning and you have about 15, 20 ounces or so of water as you're getting ready. Maybe for some people, if they like something warm in the morning, that could be a, a, a mug of warm water with a little lemon squeeze in there, whatever. Um, but get some water first thing in the morning when you're able to get the water and drink the water. Then some of those hydrating fruits and vegetables that I was mentioning, those are things like cucumbers or squash or um, cantaloupes, watermelons, peaches, um, any of those kind of, uh, of vegetables. If you're able to have a couple of handfuls of, you know, watermelon or celery or something like that in between your classes or when the kids are working on something else or whenever you're able to do that, that will give you a little bit of, of hydration. And, and a lot of people don't factor in the fact that there's plenty of hydration in the foods that you eat if you're eating those right foods. Um, but that is something to kind of consider. Where could you fit in some of those hydrating fruits and vegetables during your day um, if you're not able to have a whole bottle of water? Um, so then another one was quick lunches. I need, I need quick lunch ideas that, that don't need to be heated up. Um, so, you know, this, this absolutely crushed me. I did not know that this was a thing for teachers. Um, but 
you know, back, back in my day, you know, teachers had a lounge and they went and they hung out in there and they like, it was like this elusive place. Um, and, you know, there were like grandparent volunteers that watched the kids during lunch hours. And apparently this is not a thing anymore. And so now teachers are looking for quick lunches that maybe it's a one hander that they can just walk up and down or sit with their class or whatever, but they can't heat it up. And that's okay. You don't have to heat it up. Um, but things like mason jar salads or salads in like a, a container that you can just hold and eat. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, you'd be sitting and resting and it having an actual break. But I digress. Um, things like wraps, wraps and sandwiches and pita pockets, things like that have gotten a bad rap lately because of carbs. And it's one of those things where you can cram so many hydrating vegetables into a sandwich or a wrap. Um, that uh, there, we really need to take a second look at, at those. Um, don't be afraid of the carbs. Um, but those are things that you can easily make a really balanced meal or a really balanced lunch with if you're getting like good quality wraps or good quality bread um, or pitas or, or what have you that don't have a lot of junk and preservatives and sugars added to them and all of that. And then you're getting some really good quality deli meats that are nitrate and nitrite free, um, which are preservatives. And it, you can get some really good stuff like by Boar's Head and, and other brands. Um, but And then you jam pack some vegetables in there, some dark leafy greens, which have a lot of magnesium in it, which is very calming um, and other you know great nutrients. And that's a great balanced lunch to have that you can hopefully just eat with one hand. Um, also things like veggies and hummus, so like having some pre-chopped vegetables, having a little cup of hummus or a little, you know, container of hummus and just put the veggies in there and you can walk around and, and do whatever you need to do to regulate, but then you're still getting some veggies and hummus. Hummus is a great source of, of good quality fats and proteins. And then of course the veggies are, are great as well. Um, apples and peanut butter. I know some schools can't have peanut butter in there, but apples and sun butter then. Um, those are also celery and, and like a nut butter of some sort or seed butter. Um, great source of protein, great source of, of fiber, good hydrating thing um, that it's really a balancing kind of mini, mini lunch to have that. And then if worse comes to worse, smoothies and protein shakes. I mean, this stay with me here in a second. And you know, you probably think I don't want to have a smoothie in my you know office fridge or whatever. But if you get one of those like Yetis or one of those like uh, containers that keeps things cold for like 14 hours, you can make a smoothie in the morning and make it full of really good uh, dark leafy greens, cauliflowers, all sorts of things. Try not to just overdo it with the fruit because that's just going to cause your blood sugar to, to go haywire. Um, but add a protein powder in there or something else to really balance it and stabilize that. And you can sip on that throughout the day and get a little, get some hydration, but also get some good uh, nourishing nutrients in there to help handle uh, some of the stressors. Um, and then a, a big one too, that, that multiple, I think, I think 90% of the people that I interviewed, uh, mentioned this is that they're, you're constantly given candy and not in the healthy foods by good meaning PTO members and admins and, and, and things like that. Um, so many of the teachers say we prefer healthy options. So I, I don't know how that goes in the school districts and things like that, but that is something to definitely bring up with admins and bring up with, with whoever will listen, but that's where the habit part comes back in. And that's where even if there are unhealthy options around, you do not have to have them. If you want them, have it. Great. If you're really thinking like, this is going to cause me to have a headache later, I don't want it. It's okay to say no thank you. It's okay to take it. And I told this to somebody once and I thought she was going <laughs> to have a meltdown. I said, why don't you just take it and throw it away? And she goes, I can't do that. I'm like, why? <laughs> Why not? If it's something that you're just being polite, and I understand Southern manners, I get it. But if you're just being polite, but you truly do not want the thing, it is okay to give it to somebody else or it's okay to throw it away. And if that feels itchy for you, if you feel really uncomfortable with the thought of that, that might be the habit to address first. And that's just something to think about. So, um, so some simple things to, to kind of take note of, and I apologize, I think we're, we're getting to, towards the end here, but um, some simple options. Balancing your blood sugar is going to be really, really important. And when I, I mentioned it before, but balancing your blood sugar is simply me, if you're able to get at any point, some sort of nutrition could be liquid nutrition, like in a smoothie or in a protein shake. Um, it, it could be little bites here and there of things. Um, but balancing your blood sugar, you're going to want to have some sort of protein source and or a fat source and then a carbohydrate. So what happens if you were to just eat 
a straight up carbohydrate, it's going to hit your bloodstream really quickly and it's going to spike up your glucose. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. However, when your glucose spikes up, your insulin also spikes up and that will draw the glucose out of your bloodstream really, really quickly. And that's when you get that crash. So if you are one that, um, as we say, get like the hypoglycemic where your blood sugar drops pretty low at various points throughout the day, this is an important thing for you to, to manage. Um, also if you are, you know, you get the hangries or you get the moodiness or you get that at a certain time of the day, trace yourself back to when was the last time I ate? What was it that I ate? And should I next time balance it a little bit better with some sort of protein or, or fat source or fiber source that helps to stabilize and slowly release the glucose into your bloodstream. So you don't have that spike and crash. Um, meal prepping is is a lifesaver. Um, and if you're like, oh my gosh, one more thing I have to do on my spare time, hear me out. Meal prepping does not have to be an entire counter of these little like bento boxes, you know? For some people, that's what meal prepping is. And that's awesome. That's not my meal prepping. Meal prepping for, for many people can simply just be you're going to make all the chicken that you just bought on sale at Ingalls and you're going to grill it all up. You're going to shred half of it and freeze some of it. You're going to have that for tacos. You're going to put a little bit in a soup. You're going to have it for a wrap. You're going to have it sprinkled over a salad. So you have one thing that you've cooked once that you're going to use in multiple different meals throughout the week because it saves you time. Um, meal prepping could also just simply being chopping up the vegetables and the fruit and putting them in little baggies or containers that you can just grab and go. Um, if, if that's a big step for you, which some people that seems very uh, intense, that's okay. You can buy the pre-chopped stuff. It's a little bit more expensive, of course, but if if the initial step is simply getting the things in during the day, remove as many barriers as possible. And if that means temporarily you're going to just buy the pre-chopped stuff until you get into a better groove and a routine with it, that's okay. You can do that. Um, sleep <laughs> is another thing. Now, again, I'm a mom of four. My kids are better sleepers now, but if somebody would have just, if somebody would have told me, why don't you just get more sleep? I probably would have cried because <laughs> like, you want that so bad. But again, when you look at the habits that you're doing, your routines, are you put, are you pushing some of the things later at night? Are you pushing your bedtime later at night? And for what reason? I talked to a lot of people who they kind of declare that as their me time because the kids are in bed or, you know, the, the stress of the day is calm now. And now they want to just watch TV or they want to have a snack or they want to do whatever they want to get on TikTok or whatever. Um, and I get that you do need that me time. Absolutely. But if that is interfering with getting adequate sleep for you, then that is another habit that you're going to want to take a look at because it could be contributing to the symptoms that you're having. Um, and then of course, address the habits, addressing the habits that are keeping you locked in some of those symptoms that you're having and keeping you from handling stress better and keeping you from being stuck in routines that you no longer want to be in. You have to address some of those habits. And this is something that I talk about all the time. I've done a lot of research into habits and human behavior. Um, and I, I talk with, I started to see trends when I was talking to clients over and over and over again. I was saying the same thing. We were working on the same habits. We were working on the same patterns. We were establishing new things. And I, I felt like I'm repeating myself over and over again because this is coming up so often. So I actually just created an entire program and it's called E3. It's called the End Emotional Eating Without Guilt, Shame, or Restriction Program. It's a group program, and that's actually the next round is starting in October. So um, there's more information on my website. If that is something that's resonating with you that you want to be a part of, you can join the wait list and be notified when that is uh, up and available, and you can re uh, register for that. Um, also, uh, if you are wanting to connect on social media, um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I am not on the TikTok, um, but I'm at Food Factor Nutrition. And you can also send me an email if you feel like you have some questions that you don't want to necessarily address right now. That's okay. Feel free to send me an email. Um, I also have a ton of free handouts and things like recipes and freebies on my website. You can uh, head over there and check that out. And then if you have some specific situations or questions that you want to just uh, have a free consultation, I do those all the time, free 20 minute consultation. You can also find that information on my website. So that is all I have for everybody. I hope everyone is still <laughs> with yeah. me. I know that was a lot of information yeah. coming at you. No, it was, it was, it was great. I learned a lot. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much there um, to, to, to consider. And what I like is the idea of getting away from the idea of dieting, because it just seems like you have to make the changes that you can 
can continue on with not just do for a specific period of time trying to lose weight then then you go off it and what what happens so that's what's happened to me before is i've tried diets and they actually work and then you get to that point and you're like well i can't do this thing forever yeah. and then so you go back to other habits you go to the habits you had before the diet and then you just gain the weight back or whatever so um yeah. so much there to 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 consider and i appreciate your wisdom and, and, and time sharing uh, with us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And again, please feel free to reach out. If you just have a simple question, um, you can you know DM me on social media or, or email me if it's a little bit lengthier. We're set up a free consult. I'm happy to walk you through some of the things too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. A lot of great advice. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Have a great rest of the night. All right. You too. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. That was Stephanie Mahachek. What a Really, really great session. I, if you are just starting to tune in now, I just suggest that you go back and, and watch it from the beginning. I want to remind everybody that they'll be able to find this video later on this week at cool.us. That's the website for our Center for Educator Wellness and Learning, established by the South Carolina Education Association. All you have to do is go to cool.us and you can see all the videos that we do. Um, we would love to connect with you. Just go to the scea.org slash connect. That's in the comments. I post, posted these links in the comments. We also uh, want you to um, make sure you're registered to vote and learn about voting and understand why we're endorsing Lisa Ellis for South Carolina Superintendent of Education and a lot of other candidates that you can vote for on November 8th. So if you'd like to learn more about that, go to SCEA.org slash votes. And once again, Stephanie's website, foodfactornutrition.com slash freebies. Coming up, uh, let's see, we've got on Thursday at seven o'clock, we've got the power of the doodle with Jed Derryberry. I know a lot of you know Jed. He's a friend of mine, um, a, a great artist and uh, just a funny, interesting, not he's a, he's very humorous and interesting. Um, and I think you're going to love spending some time with Jed this Thursday from seven to eight o'clock. And on Friday, if you are in the Horry County area, or if maybe Georgetown or Marion, um, we are going to be recording. This is the first time we're going to be recording our movement podcast um, live. And we're going to do it live at the Barnes and Noble in Market Common. If you're not familiar with that, that's just put in this uh, address, 3346 Reed Street, Myrtle Beach. It's right there in the heart of Market Common. Um, all public school employees who come um, bring your ID that you'll receive a $5 Barnes and Noble gift card and a free beverage of your choice. Just make sure you bring some form of identification um, so that we can verify uh, that you are a school employee. And, and we have guest host uh, Emily Gossett, who's an, a teacher in Horry County. Look forward to the conversation with her talking about um, Horry County and, and the movement that we're trying to help build there with her leadership and, and the leadership of uh, Ronnie Porter, uh, Corey Canada, several other people. We're just uh, uh, really excited about uh, the work that we're doing in Horry County. So hopefully you'll join us uh, live Friday for that uh, event. Uh, we have a few other comments. Uh, thank you, Mindy, for tuning in. Thank you. Um, she said she got her, her Lisa Ellis postcards today. Um, someone named Porter for Richland Two School Board said she loves Jed. So we're looking forward to that. Thanks to Todd for Todd Jake, our awesome executive director, for tuning in tonight as well. And here's the final thing: um, we are trying to build a movement at the SCEA. We've brought in over 700 new members this just this summer. We are really thrilled at our movement heading in the right direction, growing. And we want you. If you are not currently a member of the SCEA, you can look at the bottom of the screen. Just go to jointhescea.org, or you can text the word "join" to 48744 and you can join our movement. We've got an amazing array of benefits. We've got an amazing array of like micro-credentials, uh, courses that you can take, all kinds of really cool resources. But what we need is your voice. We need your energy, and we need to work together to have a collective voice to build power so that we can create the kind of schools that you and your students deserve. And so it, I, we hope that everybody who's watching will consider joining the SCEA. What an amazing association bringing you content like this tonight, bringing you content like Thursday and the Movement Podcast, our um, Clear the List campaigns, our, our work with student um, students, our student chapters that Albert Jones does, um, our Uniserve directors out in the field giving doorstep service to our members, making sure that their needs are taken care of and that their voices are being heard because it's not just about joining us 
Once you join us, we want to hear your voice. We want your input and your contributions to the movement. It's not our movement at the staff's movement. It is the members movement. And that's what makes the SCEA so special. We hope that you'll be a part of it. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you on Thursday for Jed session, the power of the doodle. Until then, you have a great couple of days and I hope the school year's going well.